Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, so I'll tell you how uh, strong data processing inequalities uh, can uh, give you lower bonds for uh, communication complexity of uh, statistical estimation problems. Okay. So let's start with the problem setting. So, so we have big data and all, and uh, all the data cannot be stored in one machine. So uh, there are multiple machines, and the data is stored, uh, uh, chunk, uh, small chunks of data are stored in various machines. And now these machines need to communicate uh, in order to accomplish some task. Okay? So uh, the model of uh, communication we'll be looking at is the Blackboard model or uh, maybe it's also called the broadcast model. Okay? So there's a shared blackboard, and the machines uh, run an interactive protocol. Machine one writes something on the blackboard. Depending on that, some other machine writes something on the blackboard, and so on. Okay? So this is the communication model. And we're interested in uh, statistical estimation problems. So there's an unknown parameter theta, and the inputs to various machines uh, are IID uh, samples from a distribution parameterized by theta. Okay? And the goal of the machines is uh, run this communication protocol and finally output an estimated theta hat for this parameter theta. Okay? So the goal, uh, so they have two objectives. They want to keep the communication cost as low as possible. So the communication cost is the number of bits you will write on the blackboard okay? or the number of bits that are broadcasted. And they want to minimize the loss, uh, or the square loss, which is defined as the expected L2 norm square distance between theta hat and theta. Okay. So they're given samples, uh, unknown, uh, uh, ID samples from the di distribution d theta. And from that, they want to estimate uh, what theta is. Okay. So this is the problem setting. So are there any questions about uh, the problem? So the specific uh, statistical estimation uh, problem we'll be looking at is uh, uh, the Gaussian uh, mean estimates. Sorry. Well, what randomness? They have shared randomness? Yes, uh, they have randomness, yeah. Uh, I mean, the upper bounds hold without randomness, and the lower bounds hold with, yeah. So I mean, the upper bounds are really simple in this model, and the lower bounds ho hold in the strongest possible setting. Uh, yeah. So the specific uh, problem we'll be looking at is uh, Gaussian mean estimation, although our results are very general and can be used to study other mean estimation problems as well. So uh, th there are a number of parameters in this problem. Uh, later when I'll present the proofs, I'll shave off a lot of parameters. But for now, let me state the problem in full uh, generality. Okay. So there's an ambient dimension D. So uh, the, dis the Gaussian distribution is in RD. Uh, there's a sparsity parameter K. So the mean theta, which is a vector in RD, uh, it will have only k non-zero coordinates. Okay? So the sparsity of the mean is k. The number of machines is m. Each machine holds n, sample, n samples from the distribution. The standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution in each coordinate is sigma. And so, for example, a particular sample uh, xjt, this is the th sample that machine j gets. It, uh, each of its coordinates is an uh, independent Gaussian distribution with uh, standard deviation sigma and mean uh, theta i. Okay? So this is the setting, and their goal is to estimate this uh, theta 1 to theta d by communicating. Okay? So, so since there are so many parameters in the problem, uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you so the higher value of these parameters uh, means what for the problem. Okay, so if you increase the ambient dimension d, it makes uh, the job of the machines harder. Okay, it's a higher dimensional problem. It's harder to estimate this theta one to theta, uh, theta one to theta d. If you increase the sparsity parameter k, now the mean is not so sparse, so it again makes the problem harder. Okay, if you increase the number of machines. Uh, this makes the problem easier because now you have access to more data. Okay? Assuming that the number of data each machine gets is the same, the increase the number of machines makes the problem easier. If you increase the number of samples each machine holds, it again makes the problem easier because now you have access to more samples. If you increase the standard deviation sigma, this makes the problem harder because now the distributions are more well spread. It's harder to estimate the mean. Okay? So, so these are the parameters of the problem. Okay, so any questions? Uh, okay, so, so 
so let's first look at what are the upper bounds known for this problem. So let's first look at the statistical limit, okay? Assume that all the samples are available only to one machine. Uh, what can you do in this setting? So, so let's look at the dense case first. So k equals d. Total number of samples is n times m and the standard deviation in each coordinate is sigma, okay? So classical statistical theory tells us that the best estimator for the Gaussian distributions is just take the average of the samples in each coordinate, okay? And uh, what is the, what would be the loss in this, uh, for this estimator? Uh, it would be uh, sigma square d over nm, okay? So the loss on each coordinate would be sigma square over nm, okay? So if you have one sample, the variance is sigma square. If you take the average of nm samples, the variance would be sigma square over nm. And this is the loss on one coordinate. The total loss on d coordinates is sigma square d over nm. Okay. Is that the loss? Yes, the loss is defined as the expected uh, loss. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the statistical limit when all the samples are available to one machine. So uh, so what is the trivial co communication protocol when not all the samples are available to uh, one machine? So each machine can send the average of its samples. Uh, and write it on the blackboard. And later, you can take the average of these averages to compute the average of all the samples, okay? So uh, each, uh, the average on each machine is a uh, vector in RD, so, and you will write it up to some precision, so up to some log factors, each machine will uh, spend D amounts of communication, so the total communication would be D times M, okay? So with communication cost D times M, you can achieve a loss of sigma square D over NM by just uh, running the trivial averaging protocol. Now suppose that only L machines send the average of the samples. So now you, we can reduce the communication cost. This would be D times L, but the loss would be sigma square D over N times L because you're only looking at NL of the samples, okay? So this is sort of a trade-off between loss and communication, and the question is whether these trade-offs are tight. And in fact, these trade-offs are tight. So, uh, so up to logarithmic factors, uh, a paper of uh, Ducci, Jordan, Wainwright, and Zhang proved that these trade-offs are tight. This was al also proven in uh, another joint work with uh, Ma and uh, Nguyen. Okay. So this trivial protocol is essentially the best you can do for uh, Gaussian's uh, mean estimation. Okay. This communication loss trade-offs are tight. So what we are studying is the sparse setting. Okay. So let's move on to the sparse setting and first look at the statistical limit in the sparse setting. So now uh, uh, the sparsity parameter k is much smaller than d, okay? So each, the, the mean theta has only k non-zero coordinates. Again, the total number of samples is n times m. The standard deviation is sigma. And uh, now what, uh, what is the square loss uh, in the statistical limit? What do you think is the answer? Uh, it's, uh, it's sigma square k over nm because only k uh, of the uh, dimensions matter because sparsity is k, okay? So uh, still, I mean, now the estimator is a bit more complicated. You still take the average of your samples, but if the average on some coordinate is too close to zero, you will round it, or, uh, you will round it to zero, okay? Specifically, if the, uh, if, if the average on some coordinate lies within 10 standard deviations, uh, right, then you will round it off to zero. So in the coordinates where the mean is zero, the, with very low probability, the average will ever get out of this interval. So on the, on the coordinates where it's zero, you pay no loss at all. And uh, this rounding might increase the loss on some other coordinates where the mean is non-zero, but it only increases by a constant factor, okay? So the loss you pay is, pay is sigma square k over nm, okay? So only k of the coordinates matter. And uh, so this was the statistical limit. What is the uh, communication protocol that can achieve uh, this? So again, there's again a, a trivial communication protocol. Each machine can send the average of the samples and write it on the blackboard. And from there, you can compute uh, the estimator. And this has still communication cost uh, over t uh, O of D times M. Yes. 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 So, uh, so because we no, no, no. So, I mean, we, no, no. We only writing uh, bits. So, if you want to write a real number, you can 
truncate it up to some precision. So, and because we only want the loss up to some error, I mean, this, should, I mean, this will be fine. Okay. Yeah, so we are truncating the real number and writing those on the blackboard. Okay. Uh, so in this trivial communication protocol, the cost is still d times m up to logarithmic factors. So it scales with the ambient dimension, not the sparsity. The question is, can we pay uh, only the sparsity even in the communication? Can we, uh, can we achieve communication of k times m? So, so what do you think? Is the answer d times m or k times m to have the optimal performance? How many people think it's d times m? K times m. Okay, uh, so uh, so it turns out we prove that the answer is actually d times m. There's a lower bound of d times m. You cannot pay in the sparsity. Uh, the issue is that uh, sort of in the communication setting, you need to work in order to, in order to figure out which coordinates have mean zero. Okay, uh, you need to spend communication in order to figure that out. Uh, this doesn't come for free. Sorry? Work means? Yes, sorry. Work means communication. Yes. Yes? You know, when n is large enough, uh, each uh, you know, by itself can get a good estimate of whether some order yes. is zero or not. So, uh, so the loss we want is sigma square k divided by n times m. So if you want this loss, each machine doesn't have enough samples uh, to estimate which uh, coordinates are zero. I mean, uh, the non-zero could be closer to zero. Okay. Yeah. So each machine might not have enough samples to figure out which are the zero coordinates. Okay. Uh, it's only true, like in a particular regime. No, no. So uh, in fact, uh, we prove. A, no, no, no. So we prove an exact uh, communication loss trade-off. Okay. So I mean, we prove this formula. If the communication is C, then the R is lower bounded by something. Uh, you don't need to figure out, uh, I mean, read this, what, what this is. But the point is that this is tight uh, trade-off up to a log d factor. So each point in this curve can be achieved by a protocol, and this is also the lower bound. Okay. Uh, so, so in the spa, uh, sparse setting, this is tight up to a log d factor uh, in communication. In the dense setting, in fact, this is tight up to constant factors. You don't even pay logarithmic factors. So. Uh, in the previous lower bounds, uh, they had logarithmic factors both in the upper bound and the lower bound, and we shave both of these factors. Okay. So as I said, uh, sigma square k over nm is the statistical limit. So to achieve this, in particular, to achieve this statistical limit uh, uh, for r, the uh, uh, for the optimal performance, the communication you need, c should be m times d and not m times k. Okay. If you say in this formula, only if you plug in c equals m times d, you will achieve the statistical limit. Okay. So, uh, so sort of the takeoff message is even in the uh, even if you estimating the mean of sparse Gaussians, uh, you have to pay a factor in the ambient dimension either in the communication or in the loss. Okay. Uh, you can't uh, save the ambient dimension uh, in both the settings. Okay, in both communication and loss. Okay. So. Uh, so this is what we prove. Uh, so let me just uh, say a bit about prior work. I already mentioned some of these. So Ducci, Jordan, Wainwright, and Zhang, they studied the case when the dimension is 1. And they proved uh, omega m lower bounds, uh, which are optimal. Uh, and in the, dense, in the dense case, when the dimension is higher, they only proved lower bounds for simultaneous protocols. It's a restricted uh, communication model. So Shamir in 2014, he uh, studied the case when the sparsity is exactly one, and he proved lower bounds in some restricted communication models. Uh, then Ducci, Jordan, Wainwright, and Zhang, they handled the, uh, the dense case for arbitrary protocols. And this was also achieved in a joint work with Ma and Nguyen. And there all, uh, has been a lot of recent work on communication uh, efficient distributed learning, okay. in general, which I am not mentioning. Uh, okay, so so the problem uh, will redu will reduce it to a s much simpler problem uh, with much uh, fewer parameters. Okay, so this is if this we call the Gaussian mean detection problem. It's a one-dimensional problem. Okay, uh, so the 
so there are two distributions mu 0 is the gaussian with mean 0 and uh, variance 1 and mu 1 is the gaussian with mean delta and variance 1 okay so it's a slightly shifted gaussian each machine would get just one sample from uh, uh, i mean so from the distribution it's either mu 0 or mu 1 so you choose a particular distribution and each machine will get one sample from a distribution and we want that uh, in order to distinguish which was the case the uh, the machines will have to spend uh, 1 over delta square of information. Okay. So, in particular uh, to distinguish between mu 0 and mu 1, so, so what I mean is that the amount of information the players have to the machines have to write on the blackboard about the inputs has to be 1 over delta square. This will uh, this will be the goal uh, what we will prove. So, so we will prove something about mean information cost which is uh, essential due to sparsity I will come to the definition of this. Okay. I will define this information cast and all, but this is the problem. Uh, they want to distinguish between mu 0 and mu 1 okay? and each machine gets one sample from the distribution. So, uh, an informal theorem uh, so that we prove in the paper is that if distinguish, distinguishing between this mu 0 and mu 1 is impossible using uh, 1 over delta square information cost, then that implies the rate uh, communication trade of that I mentioned. So, it is sort of I mean th this is proven using some standard direct sum arguments from uh, information complexity uh, particularly we use the addit additivity or the chain rule of mutual information and the fact that the square loss is additive over coordinates and it requires some other tricks. But I won't uh, go into the proof of this theorem uh, because it is standard uh, what I will tell you is how to prove the lower bound for the Gaussian mean detection problem. So, so before that let, let me define what, what I mean by information cost. Okay. So, now uh, so we have uh, uh, this parameter v now it is just a bit. So, v is just a bit distributed according to Bernoulli half and there is a distribution mu v which is Gaussian with mean delta v and variance 1. So, each of the uh, machines gets one sample from this distribution mu v and then they run a protocol the interactive protocol right on the blackboard and all and let us denote the transcript of this protocol by pi. The information cost of the protocol pi is how much information the players are writing on the blackboard about their inputs it is the mutual information between pi and x 1 to x m ok. This is the information cost ok. The mean information cost is what we need to work with is the minimum over small v uh, which is 0 or 1 the information cost that the protocol writes about the inputs conditioned on the capital capital V being small v. Okay. So, we only look at uh, the I mean we look at both the settings of v and you minimize the amount of the information you are revealing. Okay. Uh, this is something you have to work with for technical results uh, uh, which I uh, maybe I will mention a bit. So, so, this is the mean information cost and we want this quantity to be omega 1 over delta square and will be done. So, just a little warning this is not the same as conditioning on v because conditioning on v will, will you will take a expectation, but we want the minimum uh, in both the cases ok. And uh, uh, in principle one of the cases could be much smaller than the other. So, it is a bit more it is trickier to prove the lower bound on mean information cost. Uh, rather than uh, expected information cost. Okay. In fact, the previous techniques of uh, Ducci uh, et al they did not apply to this mean information cost setting. Okay. So, so, uh, so, we have to work with mean information cost instead of information cost because of sparsity this is what I mentioned. So, some it is a subtle point I do not want to get into for the CS audience uh, if you are familiar with the proof of lower bound for disjointness uh, there also when you measure the information cost for end you only work with distributions. Uh, which evaluate always evaluate to 0 ok. So, there is an asymmetry and that is exactly what uh, what is happening here it is the same uh, reason we have to work with mean information cost inf instead of information cost ok. Uh, okay. So, so, so let me so the main one of the main tools in proving the lower bound on this mean, from, mean information cost is our so called strong data processing inequalities ok. So, what are these? So, we all know the classical data processing inequality. Uh, says the following let y z be jointly distributed random variables then the data processing inequality says that for any Markov chain u y z the information uh, between u and z is bounded by the information between u and y ok. This is the data processing inequality we all know 
it, in words, it's saying that the information dissipates across the channel Y to Z. Okay. And but the point is that for specific Y, y and Z, we could expect something much stronger. Okay. And uh, these are these are setting of strong data processing inequalities. Okay. So now again, you fix Y and Z. Strong data processing inequalities try to make a statement of this form. For any Markov chain U, Y, Z, the mutual information between U and Z is bounded by some constant beta much less than one, uh, the information in U and Y, okay? So the information, it says that information strongly dissipates across the channel Y to Z, okay? So not only the information in U and Z is smaller than information U and Y, but in some cases it's much smaller than information uh, between U and Y, okay? The information is strongly dissipating across the channel. And I mean, these strong data processing inequalities have a rich history in the information theory literature. Uh, so some of the, uh, I mean, these are some of the references uh, which study these strong data processing inequalities. Uh, I'm sure there are many more, but these are some of the references I know. So uh, as far as I know, this was all started uh, in this uh, very nice paper of uh, Alsworth and uh, Gash. So what they proved was the following, or one of the things that they proved was the following. So let Y be just a random bit, uh, distributing according to Bernoulli half. Z is obtained from Y by flipping uh, Y with probability alpha, or in other words, passing Y through the binary symmetric channel uh, with error alpha, okay? Then for any Markov chain U, Y, Z, the mutual information between U and Z is bounded by one minus two alpha square times the mutual information u and y. Okay, so uh, uh, across the binary symmetric channel, the information strongly dissipates. Okay, so this is what to prove. So, any questions about strong data processing inequalities? Okay, uh, so this is one example. Uh, uh, the example we'll need is the following, which is uh, more pertinent to our setting. So suppose uh, V is a bit, which is Bernoulli half. Condition on V equals zero, the random variable X is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with mean zero. Condition on X equals, uh, condition on y, V equals one, the random variable X is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with mean delta. And we want that for any Markov chain U, X, V, the mutual information between U and V is much smaller than the mutual information U and X, okay? And so what, what, is, what do you think is the optimal uh, constant beta that I can put here? Any guesses? So it's, it's some function of delta. What is U, uh, So uh, you understand X and V? So, Yes, so, and for any Markov chain U, X, V, so any random variable U. Yes. And X is the normal. Yes. And what is U? So any random variable U. Any U. Yes, any U, uh, which forms a Markov chain with X and V, uh, the information should dissipate. Okay. The information between U and V should be much smaller than information U and X. So the constant delta, uh, so constant beta is some function of delta. So in fact, it's delta square. The information u and v is at most delta square between information u and x. If you convey one bit of information about x, the amount of information it conveys about v is just delta square. Okay. So, so, I, so I haven't seen this. Uh, I, I tried to find a reference for this. I haven't seen this, but this follows from uh, transportation cost inequalities. And, uh, and a lemma in uh, paper of Raginsky. Okay. And uh, so to achieve this delta square, what do you think is the optimal U to take? Uh, wh what is the U that uh, maximizes this information ratio uh, between V and X? So just the sine of X. If you, saw, if you look at sine of X, the information it conveys about X is one bit, okay? but the information it will convey about V will be roughly delta square. 
Okay, so uh, these are strong data processing qualities and uh, this will help us prove the lower bound for the Gaussian mean detection problem, okay. Uh, so any questions till now? Okay, so I'll move on, uh, move on uh, to proving the lower bound for Gaussian mean uh, detection. So I'll prove a lower bound for a baby case of simultaneous messages, okay. So I'll explain what this means, uh, but uh, the proof for this ex fits in one slide, okay. Uh, the strong data processing qualities are so powerful. Okay, so let's remind us ourselves of the setting. So V is a Bernoulli half bit, there are M machines. Machine I uh, gets one sample Xi, which is distributed according to this mu V. And uh, the machines communicate, but in the simultaneous uh, protocol, okay. So machine I writes a message uh, depending on its input on the blackboard, and all the machines do this simultaneously. And after seeing this messages, uh, pi 1 to pi m, uh, one should be able to get a good estimate whether v was 0 or 1, okay. Uh, this is a goal. Uh, I mean, this is the goal of the uh, machines and our goal is to prove that uh, this cannot be done uh, in low information cost. So if, if this pi 1 to pi m convey whether v was 0 or 1, then the information these are conveying about x1 to xm has to be omega 1 over delta square. This is what we want to prove. And the intuition is clear, right? Our strong data processing inequality says that the information that machine I conveys about V, this is at most delta square times the information this machine I conveys about Xi. This is what our uh, strong data processing inequality tells us. So if you want to convey omega 1 information about V, the machines have to convey 1 over delta square information about the inputs. So this is the intuition and this can be formalized in this uh, one slide, okay. So we are looking at this expression, uh, information in pi 1 to pi m and x1 to xm. Uh, this is lower bounded by the summation over i of the information between this messages and xi, okay. This is basically, I guess, super additivity of information. Uh, it follows from the fact that x1 to xm are independent condition on v, okay. This is something you can check. Uh, this is true. Now, if you look at the ith term, the information this message is conveyed about xi is exactly the information that the ith message conveys about xi. The remaining messages do not convey, convey any information about xi, okay. Uh, this term is roughly information pi i conveys about xi. So, I am cheating a little bit here, uh, forget uh, what is cheating. So, now we are ready to apply our strong data processing inequality. The information pi i conveys about xi is at least 1 over delta square times the information uh, pi i conveys about v. So we get this term, summation information pi i conveys about y. And then this is lower bounded by the information all of these messages convey about v, okay. This sort of, I guess now this is sub additivity of information. It's again the same, uh, uh, same reason pi 1 to pi m are independent condition on v. Uh, uh, I mean the reason the inequality goes in the other direction is because you are measuring the information conveying, conveyed about V and not condition on V, okay. So and uh, this is omega 1 over delta square because the information conveyed about V has to be omega 1, okay. So, so this is the proof of the lower bound. So the main step here is the strong data processing inequality, okay. Okay, so any questions? This proof. Okay, so 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 what is the idea for the general case? So this is the right high level idea. Uh, there are two issues. Uh, it's not clear how to deal with the additivity of over coordinates, so, right? So here we said that the summation of the information uh, the players convey about v is roughly the information altogether they can convey about v. Uh, but this is much more tricky in the interactive setting. Uh, so the key step is to uh, we want a right way to define this quantity. The information the protocol conveys about V through player I, okay. So there are, we need uh, to define this uh, correctly and then uh, use the theory of Hellinger distances uh, to prove that uh, there is additivity of coordinates. So the amount of information protocol conveys about V through player I, if you add this up, this is the amount of information uh, the protocol conveys about V, okay. 
And for this, you need Hellinger distance. And spe uh, specifically, we need a lemma in one of the papers of Jairam. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this is all I say about the intuition for the proof. Um, and I'll end uh, the technical part by uh, sort of stating our result in full uh, generality. So again, V is a Bernoulli half a random bit. X condition V equals 0 is distributed according to mu 0. X condition V equals 1 is distributed according to mu 1. Let beta be the strong data processing inequality constant. In other words, it says that uh, if you're conveying uh, one bit of information about x, that then you are conveying only beta bits of information about v. Okay? This is the constant beta for these two distributions. Then our main theorem is that uh, this inequality can be, is also true in a distributed setting. Okay? So if condition on v, you give various samples to various players and they engage in a protocol, then the information this protocol conveys about v is at most beta times the information cost of this protocol. Okay? So if the protocol conveys one bit of information about all the inputs, the amount of information conveys about V is just beta. Okay. So the strong data processing quality uh, can be generalized uh, to this distributed setting. So this is the most general result. And from this, uh, the lower bound for Gaussian mean estimation sort of follows by seeing that beta is delta square. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, so so to conclude, uh, we prove uh, tight bounds for uh, loss communication trade-offs for the Gaussian mean estimation problem, both in the dense and sparse case. Uh, the takeoff message in the sparse case is that uh, either the communication cost or the square loss has to depend on the ambient dimension. You can't say uh, you can't uh, save the ambient dimension in both the settings. So the same conclusion also holds for something called sparse linear regression. I haven't defined this, so uh, I won't uh, go into this. Okay. But there's an easy reduction to sparse Gaussian mean estimation. So to end with some open problems, well, these are not really open problems, just uh, some statements. So uh, I mean, yeah, so one interesting direction is uh, studying other statistical questions in the distributed communication complexity framework. And uh, another uh, direction I think is very interesting uh, is the strong data processing inequalities are really powerful. And I think they should, this, they should probably find more applications in uh, communication complexity. Okay. So one particular application I'll mention is uh, the gap Hamming distance problem. Okay. Uh, so it's a two party communication problem. Uh, here Alice has an n bit string x and Bob has an n bit string y. They have promised that the Hamming distance between these uh, strings is at least n over 2 plus square root n, or at most n over 2 minus square root n. And the task uh, these players have to accomplish is determine which is the case. Okay. So in a very nice paper, uh, Chakrabarti and Raghav, they proved that the randomized communication complexity of this uh, task is omega n. Okay. And uh, this is a very useful theorem. Uh, gap Hamming distance uh, along with disjoinness is uh, one of the most important problems in communication complexity. Uh, I mean, sort of still we lack an information theoretic understanding of this problem. Okay? So let me try to convince you why this low bond is sort of uh, 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 it makes sense. Okay? So, so here's a hard distribution for the problem. Again, we have this uh, parameter v. We obtain z1 to zn by independently passing v through a binary symmetric channel with uh, error probability half minus uh, c over square root n for some constant z. Okay? So each zi is obtained by flipping v with probability half minus c over square root n. Okay? And then you set x, x and y such that the x, xor of x and y is zi. Okay? So the point is that a protocol which solves the gap Hamming distance problem on the strings x and y, it gets omega 1 information about v. Okay? Uh, but each coordinate only contains 1 over n information about v. Okay? Zi is obtained by passing it through this binary symmetric channel uh, and the information it contains is just 1 over n. So sort of to get one over omega 1 information about v, you need to get omega n information about the inputs. 
because uh, there's, there's a, uh, I mean, for every bit, you only get one over n information about b. Okay? Uh, but, but sort of, uh, I, I don't know how to formalize this proof. The main issue is how do you define how much information, uh, how much information uh, the protocol conveys about v through coordinate i. Okay, the, you need to define this in the right way and then, then deal with the additivity of our coordinates, which is much trickier in this setting, uh, in the two-party setting. Uh, okay, so I'll end there. Thank you.